Greetings, I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. If you are a returning listener or subscriber, and you heard that intro music and knew it was time to get down, welcome back! And we're talking about something that I got to do for several years all over various parts of this beautiful emerald sphere we call Earth punk music if you like that intro and if you don't like the intro I don't care. But if you like that intro it's my band bitter lake and one of the playlists that's up with all these playlists from our music series is actually the live set playlist to our live set most of those songs are songs that we play live And I've been ordered by one of the members to do at least one more show. So we're trying to do one more show. Speaking of live shows, June 8th at Bus Boys and Poets in Washington, D.C., we will be live. You have an unnatural elite. Oops. Beyond the Black Jacobin, CLR James and the Struggle for Socialism in America. Adolph Reed, my co-host, my homie, my dog, Pascal Robert, Daniel Tutt. Eric Varn, me, uh, as MC calls him, my stunt double, Billy Bunton. Apparently, there's going to be an after party. We're still planning that out. Well, that's going to be there's even more speakers that couldn't fit on the main show. So get your tickets now, wherever you are watching or listening to the show. There should be links in the description to get tickets to that. Also, unlike when Ben and I do a live thing, this is actually going to be streamed. So if you can't make it out to DC, you can still see the shindig. That being said, it is just me tonight. Pascal and MT have the night off as they'll be filling in for me tomorrow, or Saturday. The history of punk music in the Soviet Union. How many of you know anything about punk music in the Soviet Union? I know the online Stalinists won't dig this episode, but one thing I love is punk and metal music. I've had the opportunity to play and record it all over the place. And if you've read the best-selling pamphlet on everyday analysis, I was a teenage anarchist, then you also know I'm intrigued about the history of punk. And punk's history in the USSR is a complex story of a true underground movement at odds with state repression. Unlike its American counterpart, Soviet punk didn't have a definitive sound. There wasn't a music industry or a media apparatus to tell young aspiring counterculturists what was good and what punk is supposed to look like. There was no tape trading scene helped by physical media magazines like you had in the West. In the Soviet scene, people learned how to press vinyl on x-rays. We'll talk about that in the show as well. That's really interesting. We're also going to talk about the documentary film that my good friend and TIR cousin, if you will. Alexander's like a TIR cousin. Has completed discussing what happened to the punk scene with the Russians that have fled since the Ukraine war. So please welcome TIR cousin, Alexander Herbert. You call me Unk. You call me T.I.R. Unk. Unk? You are Unk? <laughs> I was watching a video last night. It was like it was like a comedy one where um, someone called like a dude Unk and he was like, wait a minute, how old do you think I am? And the kid was like 35. But he's like, yeah. And he's like, that means you Unk. You Damn. Unk. I was like, damn, all right. All right. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, my daughter's boyfriend, they've been together, Jesus. No, six seven years and ever since um they met he's been calling me pops so mm, mm, mm. I'm, hey, I'm, I'm i'm starting to get okay hey man you do my, you my elder statesman role oh no spring allergies yeah the north northeast is it was actually really warm the other day for the northeast but it's good. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, sorry to divert here. 
No, 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 no. This is actually a really interesting topic. Um, I don't think people know too much about this scene because I think when we think about music, we think that it's just everywhere and, you know, we forget that there is this thing called the Iron Curtain. And how did punk even infiltrate this Iron Curtain? And what did the Soviet Cultural Commission have against it? Yeah, I think this is a, a cool opportunity to talk kind of informally about this. So um, because I I wrote this book, um, we can argue about the cover photo some other day, but um, <laughs> I wrote I wrote this book. It's published by Microcosm. It came out in 2019. And uh, when it came out, I did like a I did a book talk tour in Canada, eastern Canada and the eastern United States. And I had the West Coast tour planned. I was going flying to Seattle, renting a car, driving all the way down to Las Vegas to talk about it. I had all the venues booked and then COVID happened and I had to cancel everything. Um, So it didn't end up happening. I never had the opportunity to talk about the book on the West Coast. Um, So, I mean, this this kind of fills in for it. but this is a cool opportunity. I haven't talked about this topic or the book in a while, um, but you know, I talked about it so much and so frequently that it's it's fresh in my mind. And I mean, it, it, it's what's what's interesting to me is we, especially from the U.S. context. Like I wrote my little pamphlet. Um, I was a teenage anarchist, and I start it with the American context of of hardcore, which is, in my opinion, a derivative off of what young Americans are seeing out of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So what I've heard, and and, you know, it's hard to even hear this music because it wasn't necessarily legal. Like it was super underground. Like we think stuff is underground here. It's like, no, it was really underground. So how does it even infiltrate so people can even hear it? Because there's nothing like it in the Soviet Union at this time. We have no internet at this time, and there is a massive divide, <laughs> culturally to say the least, between um, the capitalist West and the uh, and the USSR. So, how are young people even hearing anything like this, or able to hear it? Yeah, that's a good question, and it um, it lands us in chapter one in my book, which is about the the beginning of punk in the Soviet Union, which occurs in Leningrad slash St. Petersburg, whatever. And, um, you know, if you know the map of the Soviet Union, you know that St. Petersburg slash Leningrad at the time is considered Russia's window to the West. It's on the Baltic Sea. But that also means that it's the closest to the Western border of the Soviet Union. It's very close to the Baltic states, which have more easy access to the West. And it also means that uh, it's easier to intercept radio transmissions in in St. Petersburg than it would be in Moscow or anywhere in the Far East. So the book begins with uh, this character. His name is Svin. Uh, Andrei Panov is his name. Um, and I, I sort of consider him to be the progenitor of uh, punk in the Soviet Union. And a lot of people, most of the people that I interviewed from this period were willing to admit that, yeah, Andre slash Svin, we'll call him Svin, Svin from now on, which means pig. He was the first guy. And the reason that he was able to do it is there are two ways. The first one is that his family was what you could consider a Soviet cultural bourgeois, I guess. His father lived in Israel and his mother uh, was a ballet uh, dancer. I think oh, wow. answer or instructor. And so they had some money. His the father would send money home once in a while. But that also meant that Andre uh, was not very liked in school. People considered <laughs> him, they considered him and his family to be traitors because their dad, his dad had immigrated to Israel. Um, but he still had money and he had a good sound system. And he could go to black markets in uh, Leningrad, which, as I said, because it's closest to the border, people could kind of smuggle in uh, records or they could smuggle in um, any other kind of recordings. And through those black markets, he could find some things. Uh, and one thing that he found 
in after 1977, I think 1978, was a Sex Pistols record. I'm not clear which one. I don't know if it was Never Bullets, one. Or, and I don't know if it was one yeah. of the demos, but it was what he found, right? And and the way that, because he died in the 90s, the way that the people around him uh, understood was that, you know, these kids would go to the black market and they would look for the coolest covers. Not like cover <laughs> songs, but like the coolest looking artwork on the records. I mean, is that any different? I don't know if you're old enough to remember record stores, but is that any different than us? I still got record stores today and I still do that. I go to record stores and I, I look at who's got the most original artwork, you know? Sometimes you're upset. Sometimes you get the most original artwork and you listen to it and you're like, trash. Oh, this is shit. Yes. Yeah, but oh, dude, there was I. I won't get into it now. But yeah, yeah. But I, that's that's interesting. They're just trying to find artwork in the black market. So I'm assuming they're paying if they have the money, way more for these Im smuggled imports. Right? Yeah, and that's why that's why uh, it takes Svin, like I said, from a very particular socioeconomic background, to be able to buy these things, bring them home. And then gradually he, you know, invites friends over to his house to start listening to the records. And then uh, one of his friends, this individual, Yevgeny Yufit, who some people might know as the progenitor of the film genre called necrorealism. Uh, Yevgeny Yufit is friends with Sven and he listens to the Sex Pistols and stuff. And he says, these guys, you can do what these guys are doing. Like, they don't know how to play anything, right? <laughs> and so Sven takes that serious. He's like, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I can pick up a, a bass or something like that and just start jamming. And so he does. And he invites his friends over and they they start a band. They call it Automatichiski Udolet Britney, which means the automatic satisfiers, which is a play on the name, the Sex Pistols. Um, oh, and interesting and, and and there's another thing that i i saw there's a there's a cool little documentary series i think it's called like band splaining or something mm -hmm. and they talk about this in two parts and one of the things they said was that as the late 60s and 70s were rolling around and rock music was slowly starting to infiltrate as well um there was like approved bands that had to sing these these messages but they those bands were allowed to have like electric instruments so electric instruments are flowing in um as well yeah well we, i'll get to the, okay. the approved bands because svin kind of kicks off this um this process in leningrad and victor Tsoy, who you have pictured in the, mm -hmm. in the thing he's one of these guys he's friends with svin and he's actually his first band is automatichiski he plays bass for them um, but then he, he goes off and he does his own thing. But there's also people that are amassing around these uh, these proto musicians that are around Svin that are listening to his records and enjoying them. And another one of these individuals is this character, Fyodor Lavrov, Fedi Lavrov. And Fedi, uh, he's considered the first anarcho punk of the Soviet Union. OK, he, he's younger than the rest of the guys. And so he's kind of like the outcast of them. And he decides, you know, I'm going to go and record my own stuff. So so he ends up by the 80s, um, the early 80s, writing his own music as well. That is more explicitly political. Um, but the youth in Leningrad, there's obviously an interest in rock music that is emerging, that the authorities figure better to control this than to let it kind of devolve into illegal activity, right? If we could get a handle of it, if we can control the distribution, the access to it, then that's better for us. And so the authorities in Leningrad, they approve of an institution called the Leningrad Rock Club. Um, this is in 1980, I believe is when they prove it. And they put at the helm of the rock club, of course it's staffed by uh, KGB members <laughs> for one. Interesting. It's also staffed by established rock personalities. So anybody who knows uh, Russian or Soviet rock music, you might have heard the band Akvarium. Um, Boris Grabeshikov, he's the singer. He's this kind of like um, Tom Petty of the Soviet Union, right? He's put on the board of uh, members that have to approve bands that are emitted into the rock club. The rock club serves as a sort of union, I guess, for Leningrad rockers. 
And at first, Svin and company are absolutely denied access to the rock club because punk music is just, they don't know how to play, they're unprofessional. And another element, another thing that they were required to do is in order to get access to play in the rock club, you had to submit your lyrics. Mm. Uh, the lyrics were read by a board of about five members. Again, you know, three of which, maybe four or all five, are working for the KGB at the same time. Uh, and that's their way of policing what gets at what gets public access. Uh, so Svin and them are not allowed in the rock club at first. Uh, most of Svin's lyrics are about, you know, living a dirty life and and uh, smelling bad. And, you know, he's, you can look up videos of him where he's got his pants half down and he's on stage and stuff like that. It's very like Sex Pistols-esque, right? It's all it's all parroting that Fetty at the same time. He's younger. Remember, he applies to work to, to go in the rock club and they they say you're too young. You're too new. You should go keep practicing, apply again, and come back. So, you know, if anybody told that to you or me when we were 15, we would have said, fuck you. You know, I'm never coming back here. You <laughs> that That's exactly what what I, Fetty, I still say that to this day. Fetty gets that rejection. He goes and and he he gets his friends and he records um, his own music under the the name Hotel Samaes Corenenia, which means the Self Eradication Department or the Department of Self Eradication, which is a hyper very very political band. The lyrics one of the one of the lyrics in the songs is uh, Reagan and Andropov fucked all of Europe from behind, right? And so, wow. So the the lyrics are very very politicized more than any other band in this Leningrad milieu of, of music. And this is in the early 80s. At the same time, most some people might know of uh, punk bands that emerge in Siberia. Gresdanska um, Oborona, for example, is one of them. Uh, um, uh, uh, civil Defense from Omsk, Novosibirsk. There's this whole Siberian punk movement that is also starting that is probably even more explosive than the Leningrad guys in the sense that there's a whole diversity of bands. They develop their own network of shows and, and you know, in movement. And uh, they are spearheaded more or less by this individual, uh, Yegor Letov, who is also very political. Um, and he, he manages to kind of mass produced tapes of his band, Gryzdanska Oborona. I don't know the exact number, but let's say that it's a hundred. And that's a lot for an individual to just keep copying, 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 and he distributes them. And he comes under the radar of the KGB. And so the Jesus. rumor is the rumor is that he is on the run constantly, right? Because he doesn't want to get caught. That's the rumor anyway. Um, but he's based in Siberia. So that's another kind of thing. Um, so the rock club exists throughout the 80s. Eventually, Svin and Avtomatijski uh, um, uh, eventually they get access into the rock club. And as the Soviet Union inches closer to collapse, the uh, the membership, the restrictions of the rock club are loosened up, um, which is a kind of interesting phenomenon. Um, so that's sort of the the beginning of the process, the the pro generation, I guess, of of punk in the Soviet Union. There's a lot of great bands that come out of um, Leningrad. As I said, you had, uh, I believe, Kino mm -hmm. uh, featured as the, the 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 image here. Svoy comes out of this whole uh, image, and in uh, Siberia. But the weird thing about Siberia is. Uh, uh, Yegor Letov, who's very political, um, who's on the run from the KGB, when the Soviet Union collapses, he becomes one of the leaders of what's called the National Bolshevik Party, which is a Nazi Communist Party. Um, so we could talk about the weird. Let's let's put a let's put a pin in that one because I do want to get back to that. Yeah. We can talk um, about that in a minute, but I mean, I I think a lot of punk music at a certain point devolved into Nazi adjacent or just straight up Nazi stuff, especially after '84. Yeah, um, 
but we'll we'll again we'll the put part, it the thing mm -hmm. that's so wholesome about this period this late soviet period and their access is is just hearing the stories of these the characters that are still alive and how they discovered punk music as a sound so fetty's a good example fetty didn't hear punk through spin he heard it on his own his he in, in russian most russian households at the time you lived with your like kind of extended family where you, your grandparents lived with you because they were usually the caretakers and fetty told me that every friday evening his grandmother would go up to the roof of the building with a radio interceptor right and she would intercept bbc radio transmissions of the news because she wanted to hear how the west was you know what was happening in the west and how they were reporting it and he would go up there and listen to her and he said after a certain time the news would stop and then the music would come on and he's like and i stayed for the music that's why i was there and so his first the first band that he remembers hearing and being like holy shit, what is this was the boomtown rats Oh, wow. He said that they came in through BBC radio and he was like, what is this sound? You know what I mean? I, I've only heard a little bit of the approved music because it's easier to find. Let's just be honest. Yeah. You know, even trying to find images or performances of this stuff is extremely rare because it was so underground. Um, right. To that point, what restrictions were put on rock and punk music and how did musicians, you know, even learn how to play and did anyone get imprisoned during this time okay a few questions here uh starting with restrictions the uh, obvious restrictions are the lyrics cannot be politically offensive in any way which is why again Sven was declined at first um you also had to have a level of professionalism the rock club didn't want to accept anybody who they deemed as like unprofessional or or unworthy of is, of being is it is it safe to say that the people that were beyond just the KGV people that were there but is it safe to say that their first glimpse of punk music what maybe they're seeing through whatever news outlets is this this isn't something that we Yeah. Want. Oh, absolutely. You can imagine it's almost I, I mean I'm trying to think of like a a Western analogy that that you would appreciate, but it's almost like if uh, who's the singer of Creed? What's his name? Scott. Scott Stapp. Stapp. Yeah. You can imagine if he's at like the head of a board <laughs> of approval for bands to enter into the only venue that bands are allowed to play. You can imagine that his. I, you know, I would I would go. I wouldn't even go that far. I'd say, what if you know Keith Richards is. Keith Richards was not a fan of punk music. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, because Boris, Boris from Agvadium is a little bit. I mean, he he is sort of uh, Russian rock's poster boy at the time. He is he is more or less approved as, as well. I mean, Agvadium can be played on radio and stuff like that. Um, but he's sort of at the at the forefront of accepting these bands and whether or not they come and he, honestly his opinion also doesn't really matter all that much what what matters is if these secret police members want to say uh no and in most of the time they do and even when they don't um fetty and other people who remembered going to leningrad rock club shows remembers distinctly that there are always awkward people standing there in the back you know dressed really nice they weren't they weren't young rockers right they weren't somebody's parents mm -hmm. but they were there in the back and they were observing what was going on and at the time these kids didn't understand that uh this is very much the the uh the party right this is very much the the local government trying to keep a lid on this youth movement that's bubbling up um to control it better to again better to control it than to let it go do you, do you think the there's a fear of youth movements because the soviet union is able to put a handle on the teenage thing right because that's a u.s concept right so that doesn't even exist in this world yeah in the 50s and 60s um but 
the anti-war U.S. Do you think that is the fear that they're like, look, we can't have all these hippies, and we can't have these hippie punks. <laughs> we have to put a put a put a put a pin in this now. Well, there's uh, yes, there's a sense, particularly um, with music coming from the West, that it promotes bourgeois ideals. Some of your listeners, and maybe even you, have seen that image of. Um, uh kgb labels that they put on certain western bands I was kind of making the internet earlier but but i have it up here so for example black sabbath mm -hmm. they 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 blacklisted black sabbath because it promotes violence and religious obscuritanism pink floyd was interfering in the foreign policy of the ussr in afghanistan talking heads were banned because they promoted the myth of soviet military danger uh, the Sex Pistols promoted punk and violence. B-52s, punk and violence. Madness, punk and violence. So these are, so the, the, they were very much watching um, ACDC, uh, neo-fascism and violence, Judas Priest, anti-communism and racism. Uh, oh, wow. Tina, Tina Turner, sex. <laughs> um, Van Halen, anti-Soviet propaganda, et cetera. You can go down the list. And so uh, there they're very much watching these Western bands and they're seeing that there are dangerous messages embedded within the songs. And I'm kind of opening up a, a, a rabbit hole here with your listeners, because now you're going to go back and you're going to listen to some of those songs and you'd be like, damn, they were right. Like there, there, there is a fear of, I mean, listen to the talking head song. Of, uh, what's it called? Um, about war. Jesus, I don't know. I forget the name of the song, but oh, uh, "Life in Wartime," right? It the Soviets could easily consider that promoting the threat of a Soviet uh, military danger, and so you go back and you listen to this stuff now, and you're, after learning this, and you're like, "Damn!" They well, were it's it's, fu it's funny. It's funny because the, the only juxtaposition you can have to that is the PMRC that happens at about eighty four, right? Tipper Gore, Al Gore's wife, and her crew of of uh of capitol hill wives that go out and want to censor music and they're trying to censor more so rock music yeah. with their sex and drugs lyrics so there's the the moral um censorship that you have in the united states we're not really worried about anti-war songs right which I, which is funny when you think about you know the anti-war movement we're like now nah, we're not going to censor any of these these songs that are looked at as like, oh, these are the songs of the of a generation, and uh, and the Soviet Union is like, dude, we're going to censor all this anti anti Soviet they're not, stuff. They're not dangerous in the United States in the same way that they could be in the Soviet Union for inculcating this kind of anti Soviet, anti communist, and pro Western obsession, which is something that does happen, right? These musicians, the the case of Sven is the perfect example that. It's the image of the Sex Pistols that he sees, and he's like, "Yes, this is what I want, right?" And that it's offensive to to this kind of conservative Soviet culture, uh, communist conservative culture that that sees all this stuff as bourgeois decadence, promoting mm -hmm. like immorality uh, and and bad value judgments. Um, so, but there is some truth to it. Now, the thing is that in the Soviet period. The Leningrad Rock Club is really the only place. Moscow doesn't even have its corollary. L Leningrad is the place. And to this day, St. Petersburg is still the artistic capital of, of Russia. But um, that it becomes the, the sort of institution of rock, I guess that you could say. And, and punk in its limited form um, are, are is permitted there towards the end of the Soviet period um there's some other bands that emerge uh within this uh period um Narodne Apolchenia is another one um there's a people's people's militia people's defense or something like that um Object Nasmeshik is another one. Object of Ridicule is another one of their is their name. Um, 
so some of these bands, especially towards the later part of the 80s, 86 and on, after Perestroika and Glasnos are are emitted into the rock club. And again, I think that that's more so the, the party and uh, the administration in Leningrad recognizing that, okay, now we have Perestroika and Glasnos, now we have to kind of emit. Can you, can you explain real briefly what, the, what that means uh, for the Soviet people and what Glasnost was? I, I know it's a lot, but can you just give the Cliff Notes version? Is that too much to ask? Yeah, Glasnost meant simply openness. Uh, it was a willingness on the part of uh, uh, Gorbachev's cabinet, Gorbachev, to this belief that Soviet culture had fallen behind. Uh, it wasn't keeping up with the West, and it and it was obvious. It was very evident. I mean, say what you will about the Soviet Union, if you like it or hate it, there's no denying that by 1986, most Soviet people were the limited pictures that they got of the West or even Westerners coming to the Soviet Union. They were wondering, why do these people have dryers and we don't? Why do they have blue jeans mm -hmm. and we don't? Why do they have bubble gum? Why are they allowed to chew bubble gum, but we can't? Right. And these things, they seem very, very irrelevant and ephemeral to us. But when there's enough of them stacked on top of each other, you start to ask why, you know. Do you think that had a lot to do with the fall of the Soviet Union? Like some people make the joke that uh, not joke, but kind of maybe a mild tongue in cheek statement that it's the it's the Pizza Hut commercial that Gorbachev does. The Pizza Hut commercial came after the collapse. It was after, right? But most people don't recognize that, right? Because everybody loves to hate Gorbachev, mm -hmm. and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get the the wrath of some of your listeners and especially the Stalinists. But I'm not anti Gorbachev. I think that Gorbachev was responding to very real concerns that were mm -hmm. that were present in the Soviet Union, and um, and so I think that when it came to Glasnost in particular. Uh, or you asked, did it contribute to the collapse? Um, insofar as not having access to these things prepared the Soviet people, especially the younger generation, to bigger critiques of the Soviet Union and to communist ideology, right? The fact that culture couldn't keep up. The, the Soviet Union didn't collapse because its culture was behind. The Soviet Union collapsed because the people started to realize that the culture was behind and then they found the systemic reasons of why it was behind and they latched on to these nationalist explanations of it right so we can we can explain why the soviet union is behind because uh the baltic states in central asia are holding russians back from our true economic potential mm -hmm. and that's why the soviet union collapsed right there the it's not necessarily the cultural dynamic, but it plays a major role in in informing uh, critiques of the Soviet Union. And that's why somebody like Yegor Letov joins the national Bolsheviks after the, the collapse, because a lot of these people, they are not really anti-communist. I wouldn't say that they're anti-communist. They're, they, they're on board for a, uh, you know, to use a, the, what is it? Yugoslavian term for socialism with a human face, right? They they want access to this culture. They want to feel like they're they're engaging with world culture in a real way that's not heavily guarded and policed. That's kind of romantic in in a sad way. Whenever I think about this this time and these people doing this music, because I always think about you know the freedoms as corny as it's going to sound that you have to make whatever you want to make here and, you know, kind of watching these documentaries or, and reading a little bit of the history, you know, definitely didn't, you know, do as yourself. I mean, Alex um, didn't say this, but he actually went to the Soviet Union and did interviews. You were in the archives too, didn't you? I went to, yeah, yeah I was in Russia. I did interviews um, from uh, 2014 until I, I, right up until I was done with the manuscript, 2018, and then I submitted it out to to microcosm. Um, but yeah, the 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 book is an oral history, so it's made up of interviews. I thought that as a as a Westerner, mm -hmm. it was more important for the voices of the people that participated 
in it to be out than it was for my analysis or my interpretation because but, but what written history is there for this moment because um you know, let's talk a little bit about the music you know we have something in this in the western world that was definitely big as metal and punk are are starting to become more popular mm -hmm. in the later in 70s throughout the 80s which is tape trading and there were magazines mainly out of the uk english-speaking magazines like um metal hammer and stuff like that kerrang circus rip for all the old people watching the show that remember these magazines where there were little parts in the back and the like classifieds where people said hey i'm looking for music from the bay area so if you have any bay area thrash you know here's my address and i'll send you whatever i got here in london or germany and i actually know someone you met her connie um she's you know she's older than us and she uh has friends <laughs> that actually came to visit her when she was in the states uh from tape trading mm -hmm. um but there isn't tape trading in the soviet union they're pressing music on uh x-rays and there's no sleeve you don't know what you're getting talk about the phenomenon of the x-ray yeah the the bone records as they're called bone they, records sorry yeah they um they they're a little bit before this time there's this there's a uh kind of hipster movement that develops in the soviet union after the death of stalin it's called the stilyagis it literally translates to hipsters and these are people <laughs> These are people that were, um, because, you know, with uh, Khrushchev, there's a limited opening of Western culture and, and Western people can come into the Soviet Union for the first time after Stalin's death. And so there's some exposure to new rock music, right, in the 1950s, mm -hmm. as well as kind of older forms that weren't, older forms of music that weren't really fully developed, like swing music. Mm -hmm. um, they It existed in, in Russia and in the Soviet Union, but not, they didn't have as much access to it. So the Stilyagis are listening to some of this Western <clears throat> music and uh, they want it for their home. But the Soviet Union doesn't have a vinyl pressing plant at the time. It just doesn't exist. They didn't build one. Um, and so they start pressing these music, this music on uh, x-rays that are kind of discarded and sold that way. You can still find some of them at black markets. They're, they now because everybody knows about them the 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 dealers the secondhand dealers in russia have like marketed them up mm -hmm. as like you know novelties um but you still see them around but by the 19 the late 1970s and 1980s uh, i mean under brezhnev in particular it's kind of recognized as a problem that there's this whole black market of music that exists that uh we need to get handle on because otherwise it's just going to continue feeding into this black market and so they they create the the state the, the well the state music companies like melodia they uh build the record pressing plant and they um they start pressing western label western bands western music um but in a very curated form so actually uh if you give me a second i can go get one of these you have one yeah i could show it to you, you give me oh yeah second. dude yeah definitely here let me I take can go one. run and get it just hold on oh yeah 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 yeah. no this is this is actually really fascinating because also you know people have to keep in mind that again music artists have to be approved to record in these state-sponsored recording studios so it's not legal to do like off hours recordings even um, for your own for your own side project, which is you know such common practice uh, in studios. Uh, so when Alex gets this, I'm actually really stoked to see it because it is imagine a used X-ray, and they pressed music on it. And one of the things that the government did was they would press their own because this is all black market. And again, you don't know what you're getting, right? Imagine. I, I can't even think this is so beyond even my comprehension to just have someone be like, it's music. You'll like it. You know, it's a, it's being recorded in some crazy archaic way. 
B, I have no idea what I paid good money for. You know, C, how do I even play it, right? <laughs> I was going to have to explain how, how these things got played. And um, sometimes the government would intercept them and record over them. So let's just say you were trying to get one of the hot bands and someone's like, dude, I got the, you know, new hot Russian, you know, Russian sex pistols. I got it. I got it. You're going to love it. And you get it and you put it on and you hear like four bars of Russian sex pistols. And then you hear a KGB agent go, you thought you were going to get good sounds. This is the government. Stop listening to this music. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, that is gnarly. So, you know, that's that's an interesting part of this history. You know, it's not just the people that are fighting to make it. It's even the people that are fighting to be in the scene just to get it. You know, think about, think about the ubiquitous nature of music in 2024. It's everywhere, right? We don't really value it. And I'm... That, that, I don't want to get too much into that, but making the effort to listen to whatever you can that isn't the approved stuff. So on your camera thing, Alex, yeah, um, you can you can flip it around so it's not backwards on the screen. Is it backwards on the screen? It's also in Russian, so it doesn't really matter, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't know how to flip it. You have to go into the settings and then go to video. And then go to mirror camera. Oh, the Mac MacBook settings? Nope. On the bottom. Oh, settings, video. Mirror camera. Mirror camera. There, there you go. go. There you go. Yeah. Here you go. You know who this is? It's David Bowie, isn't it? Hell yeah. That's a it's a Melodia. Wait, there it is. Melodia Records David Bowie album. Mm -hmm. Pressed in uh this is 19, 1989 was when this one was pressed. Um so again, it's a very, very curated presentation of western music once it's sort of started to be allowed into the soviet union i don't have a bone record i used to have one i don't know where it went uh they're so thin that it's like lost in my record collection they just they disintegrated i know a bunch of them disintegrated over time apparently yeah they don't work you can't use it i can't so how are they playing it the record players existed i'm assuming they have yeah they have the um uh what are they called the fucking the ones with the big speaker phonographs yeah, you can put it on there. They were using uh, phonographs in the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s? Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. Um, Alex is afraid to invert the camera because it might turn his anti-Hitler. Right. But like while you were gone, I was talking about like the effort people made to, to get music just to hear something. Like This is just the effort people are making just to hear anything. Yeah. But it's like it's again. It's not like they. It's not like they. There. It's a society devoid of music. It's just that they, you know. Imagine just having the music that your state approves. If I had to listen to the music that Joe Biden likes, I would probably shoot myself. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't want to listen to that. People always. People always want to go like, oh, I think I found this better way to do stuff on Spotify. What if the state did this? I was like, do you really want the state involved in music, dude? You don't want the state involved in music. Having the state go. involved in a an or a thing like Spotify, maybe, but in in regulating like who gets on Spotify and who doesn't, no, I wouldn't want that. I mean, that was the whole thing about Spotify that's becoming a problem for Spotify. Sites like Pandora, you had to get approved to get on Pandora, and anybody could get on Spotify. And then they, you know, of course, it got big. It got bought up by Facebook. They blocked that. Now you got to go through a distributor. I'm not going to get into all that. But, you know, I like the fact that anyone can put out a record, even if it sucks. Yeah. I mean, it, do, it does saturate the music a little bit. 
Oh, which, definitely. Which actually, to bring it back to to the Soviet case, I mean, the the limited supply of punk also is one of those things that made it extremely appealing to young people in novel, right? The, you know, it's not an oversaturated market. It's new. Um, you also asked the question of whether or not anybody got arrested. Mm -hmm. um, Fetty. The Fe uh, Fetty's story is actually really, really interesting. And there's a whole chapter of it in the um, appendix of my book, which was ghost written, guest written by our good friend, Tommy. Um, oh, no way. It's called Fuck the Legacy, Life as a Soviet Punk Dissident, written by Tommy Dean. Because um, Tommy and I interviewed Fetty together. Because Fetty was such an interesting dude. He still writes music. He lives in France. He's an emigre now. He he fled Russia when the Ukraine war started. That's when he had enough. And he's been going through years of therapy just to get over the trauma of living in the Soviet Union and then in Russia, according to him. Um, wow. But he, so he's, like I say, he's younger than the rest of these guys in the 80s. Um, he's more politically bold and daring. He's not from a bourgeois family in the same way that Sven is. Um, but he does have some access to instruments. He starts to gather stuff around him as he can and then bringing friends in to jam with him to try to, like, you know, churn out some some tapes, some tape recordings. And uh, like I said, I, I, I quoted one of the lyrics, Reagan and Andropo fucked all of Europe from behind. <laughs> you know, a song called Military Monarchy. Uh, very, very politically dissident lyrics. And so he makes these tapes. He makes about five of them. He distributes them to his friends and there's artwork in them and everything. You know, this is like, this is a real deal. And, it, and to this day, I think he's the only one that has a copy of this tape somewhere. Um, and... He said he doesn't know how exactly it happened, but he said that he believes that one of the friends that he gave the tape to gave it up to the police. Ooh. Um, and he thinks he knows who it is, but he didn't want to name anybody. But he's like, I, I, I know who it was. Um, and so they called him in. He came in. And they asked him all these questions about, he was, you know, the way he was describing it was like the classic, you know, two interrogators with the light over him. Damn. And he was like, and they were asking him these questions like, do you play music? Yes. Well, what do you write about? Well, I just write about life and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. And um, they were asking him these questions and letting him answer. And then finally, they took out his tape with the lyric sheet and everything. And they said, you want to explain this to us? Uh, it's sort of an I gotcha. Mm. And it was given to us by one of your friends that you personally Ooh. gave it to. Um, so he's fucked at that point, right? He had been, before this, he had been picked up off the street for wearing a shirt that on one side had a swastika and on the back side had a hammer and sickle and it said, no country for fools, something like that. Um, so so the, the, the police already know who he is. Mm -hmm. right? There's no mystery that he's he's a dissident, but he's young. He's a, he's a little troublemaker. Um, but this was a big deal, right? Because now he's making anti-Soviet content and he's distributing it. So they make him sign a contract. This is in 1987, I believe, mm -hmm. or, 80, or 88. They make him sign a contract that says he will never play music in the Soviet Union again. Jesus. He signs it. He's got nothing else he can do. And on top of that, they uh, draft him into the military. Good times. He goes He goes into the military, um, and he's, he's non-compliant, right? He's a non-compliant uh, military person. Um, and so, you know, usually when, when you had people like that in the Soviet military, they just they couldn't really do much with you, so they just got rid of you, usually by saying that, you uh, suffer suffer from a mental disorder. And so he's discharged uh, with schizophrenia. He is sent to a mental institution where he's in the mental institution. The way that he described it to me is, I was helping the patients that were actually mentally disturbed. He's like, I became like one of the employees there. 
because these people are neglected by staff. And he's like, and I'm there and I was taking care of people. And it became really clear to everyone that uh, that I wasn't schizophrenic. And he told me that one day the uh, head of the hospital called him in and they said that they were uh, releasing him all of a sudden. He had no idea why. He's like, I don't know what happened, but he suspects that his mom had something to do with it. He suspects Ooh. that his mom bragged the uh, institutional warden or whatever they're called um, to let him out. So he get he gets out eventually. But as long as the Soviet Union is there, he's he can't write music and he doesn't. As soon as the Soviet Union collapses, Fetty starts writing again. He gets a new project. It's not punk. After that experience, he's done with punk for until I start researching this book, which is another story. I kind of inspired him to re-release the old songs. Oh, play. Um, but he's done with punk throughout the '90s and then the the early 2000s. He doesn't want anything to do with it. Now he lives in France. He's in a new band called Floors Lava. So if you're if you're interested, <laughs> you can look up Fetty. Um, or just if you follow me on Instagram, I can send you the page too. It's pretty good. I mean, he sings in English and he has sort of the, the broken accent, but um, he's doing what he can. He, his story is absolutely bizarre, but you know, I guess that's what it takes to be the first anarcho punk in the Soviet Union. That's a hell of a title to have. Um, speaking of Russia, 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 Russia. You went back, going, going back, back to Russia and did more interviews post the pandemic lockdowns. And what was your documentary about? It was a little different. It was still about punk, but it was about a new wave of punk musicians that have been displaced. Yeah, I went, I went to Georgia. Um, so the 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 book that I wrote, it's not just about um, the Soviet period. I go all the way up to 2015. There's an evolution in um, Russian punk history because this this history that I was just describing, it's very centered in Leningrad. Right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's an explosion of punk that happens in the capitals in Moscow in particular. Uh, naive. Somebody mentioned. Uh, a band that was on MTV in the 80s. Well, Naive is the first Russian punk band that's picked up by Maximum Rock and Roll and kind of blasted. And I have that record that Maximum Rock and Roll put out. Oh, wow. Um, I think, when is this? Uh, from 19... Yeah, it still says USSR on it. Um, it's kind of the beginning of commercial punk. Naive sounds a lot like Green Day. Um and all of that, right? The, the Moscow punk is really defined by this effort to try to make money from punk. Leningrad doesn't have that. And even when it becomes St. Petersburg again, there's really no commercial impetus in punk in, in the cultural capital. Where, um, where, where does Pussy Riot come to be? There's a chapter in the book about Pussy Riot as well. Because um, you're not a big fan of Pussy Riot, right? It's not that I'm not a fan of them. It's that when I was interviewing punks, in 2014, 15, and 16, I always asked them about Pussy Riot because I had started doing interviews for the book before Pussy Riot did their big protest in um, in the church in Moscow. But then after that, I started asking people, like, what do you think about them? And everybody had more or less the same answer. The answer was, I've never seen these women before. We don't know who they are. They're not of this punk scene at all but we respect what they did i guess right they were like art students right yeah they they they're an an, an art collective movement. would you call yeah, them that that takes the label of punk and and uses that as a as a symbol of dissidence i guess that's the way to put it um but so uh yeah the the book ends around 2015 that was there's the the last interview i did was in 2018 um, but officially the date of the ending of the book is 2015. Um, and 
I considered that when I was done, I was like, I'm done with punk dog. Like I, I, I wrote the book on Russian punk. <laughs> I've given my, my heart and soul into this book, into punk. This is my, my thank you to the international punk movement. I'm done with it. And then this fucking war started. Um, and I, of course, all these people that I interviewed that I got really close to, I'm still close to them. I still follow what they're doing and they're still curious about what I'm doing. Right. And, and to some extent, people like Fetty will be like thankful to me for the rest of his life for bringing his story out um, and helping in that way. And so I was keeping tabs on what was happening with everybody as not just as the war broke out, but as Putin's mobilization order was issued. And all of these dudes that I interviewed, particularly in St. Petersburg, were either already in Georgia or they were fleeing to Georgia. They were getting the, the hell out of Russia, right? They didn't want to be drafted because they're all draft age. They're all of the age to be drafted into the military. Some of them did get draft cards. Um, and so a friend of mine messaged me a video from this place called Secret Place in Tbilisi, Georgia. And she was like, look at all these people that you know, all these Russians that are here. She's like, it's crazy. And I was like, yeah, this is like, this is like a massive punk exodus, right? That I've never seen the likes of before. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody should document it. She was like, yeah, you should write another book about it. And I was like, you know what? Like, I don't think I, I like, you know, the book was cool, and I don't know how many copies were sold, but I was like, I kind of, I don't want to write a, a book about this, because I don't think you could really offload enough copies of a book that is about Russian punks leaving Russia to go to Georgia. You know what I mean? I could think mm -hmm. of like 10 people that would actually buy that book. Exactly. It's um, very niche. But I was like, a movie? If I could direct a movie, put together a movie somehow... Then, you know, people who are even passively interested would be like, hey, why not? You know, it's an hour. I'll take the time. I mean, we made it. We made a trailer while you were here. Yep. And we got hella stoked making that. Well, I did. I can't speak for you. I was getting pretty stoked making that trailer. I did. Yeah. I, I mean, everything that's come together for it has been exciting because I, my, I mean, you can probably hear from just me talking. My favorite medium is written, right? I don't, I'm not a good talker. I don't like the sound of my voice. Um, my favorite medium is definitely writing. It's where I can communicate the most. And that's a plug for my sub stack. Um, <laughs> but, but for me, it was like, okay, I don't want to take the time to, to write this book because it also takes like two years for a book to be published to be actually printed and distributed. And I was like, and you know, a lot could change in two years. The war could be over by that time. Um, so I was like, what if I get to Georgia, take a whole bunch of footage uh, and then do what I did with the book, right? With the book, I had a pile of interviews. I don't have the, I have a binder of them still somewhere, but not in here. I had a pile of interviews, over a hundred interviews that to begin sitting down, being like, I'm going to start this book. I broke the interviews up into epochs, into decades, right? Mm -hmm. This is this is the 70s, this is the 80s, this is the early 90s, this is the late 90s. It kept going like that. And then I was like, okay, now one by one, I'm going to go through each epoch, reading the interviews, finding the common threads, finding like the interesting stories, and then put them together, cut them out, literally cut them out, put them together and try to form a narrative based on what these people are saying. So I was like, what if I did that with a movie, right? With, mm -hmm. with, with recorded interviews and, and you know, B-roll footage. And so that's what I've come to do. And, you know, uh, the movie is almost fully complete. We're very close. The, the premiere of the movie is May 3rd in Providence. Then it's going to be, um, then I'm going to Europe in June to show it. And then... It's going to be streaming on Right Brain TV, which is a kind of new streaming platform. And they're going to have it for two months. And then after that two months, it's going to go on YouTube. Um, that's kind of the plan right now. 
uh, and the only people that have seen it is Tyler, who's doing the editing, because you know, I can I I made this sort of storyboard where the clips are, and I'm in charge of saying like aesthetically this looks like shit aesthetically this looks cool maybe you should try doing this so i'm directing in that way but tyler is the the powerhouse of editing and that dude has been working fast uh and and working well um he's based in la um so he's seen it obviously because he's working on it i've seen where we're at now and then the dudes from right brain have seen a version of it um and so I'm excited for everyone else to see it, um, how it comes. And I, and I kind of see it as, I guess, it's almost like an appendix chapter of this book, right? It's like the, the afterword. Mm -hmm. Because the name of the book is What About Tomorrow, right? Because there's this sense in throughout all the chapters of the book, throughout all the stories of Russia, of Soviet and then Russian punk that you know, things can get better. We just have to keep working for it. We just have to keep going. And, and every decade throws its new obstacles. In the 70s and in the 80s, you had the obstacles of, of Soviet control over the music industry. In the 90s, you had the obstacles of uh, this uh, bifurcation of the scene between neo-Nazis and, you know, politically apolitical people, right, that were just sick of politics in the 80s. By the early 2000s, you get a very uh strong very coherent anti-fascist hardcore movement right which is necessary because nazism neo-nazism had become such a political force in the early 2000s so at every epoch there's a sort of struggle and everyone's and they're all kind of pushing back trying to carve out a place for the scene and so the the book is called what about tomorrow because it's an optimistic look um and then the name of the movie is Nothing Lasts Forever, right? Because now the new obstacle is these people, some of them who are in the book, forced to leave their country, you know? They don't want to return. They're they're ashamed of what's, what Russia's doing. For better or for worse, I mean, that's the thing, too, is, like, I have my own political views on what's going on uh, with Russia and Ukraine and how it's going to end up. But uh, these Russian punks people that I have interviewed, um, they have their own view. And I, I try not to get too political about it. Um, Moscow Death Brigade, I interviewed some of the members of Moscow Death Brigade. They're in the book, too. So, you know, in closing, let me ask you this question. As a young person that grew up in a punk slash hardcore scene in the northeastern part of the country, would you say what you came to find in the Soviet Union punk scene or, or researching the Soviet Union punk scene, did it seem more hopeful than the nihilism that we had in the States? Or do you think it married it? Um, it's a hard question. I think, I, that's, I think that every decade of Soviet and Russian punk and hardcore is so different than what had existed because the underlying socioeconomic and political changes had such an impact on um, what these people could express, who they were encountering, uh, the venues that they could play in, how they could get music, how they could distribute it. I mean, the the early nine, the early two thousands, up until from about two thousand to maybe two thousand eight, are kind of seen as this zenith point because. You have both commercial punk, mostly in Moscow, bands like Tadakani, Naive, uh, Distemper. And then you have the growth of like zines. Sad Wave is a major one that, that develops. You have the growth of, um, <clears throat> what are they called? Uh, they're getting um, access to the internet, but they're also getting... Um, uh, what is it called? Record labels that issue their catalogs, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting physical catalogs where, you know, some Russian, some aspiring Russian punk can see a, a, an album by, I don't know, the virus. And they can be like, this seems cool. I want this. And they can order it. They can send it off and they can get copies back. So you start getting distros in Russia. These are people that are buying 
a lot of quantities of the virus album, right? And and then reselling it in Russia. And so the early 20s are seen as this kind of apex moment. But at the same time, there's a very real, very large uh, neo-Nazi movement in Russia that uh, is a danger to a lot of the people that like listening to punk and going to shows, but they're not, they didn't sign up for the violent aspects of it. You know what I mean? Like couples. There's some stories that the two thousand. I have a whole chapter. Um, uh, I have a whole chapter in this book on the anti-fascist movement um, because there's a whole, there's an entire kind of decade where there are bomb threats that are called into shows. There are street street brawls that happen, like groups of people just fighting each other, like war. Um, and there has to be some kind of organized resistance to that um, to that thing. So, is it optimistic? I think that I think that you know the cool thing was interviewing members of or punks from different generations in throughout Russia's his, past 50 years history and just seeing the different experiences that they all had. Um, and then seeing more importantly, how it's so related to political and socioeconomic conditions, right? Even if they don't understand it that way, you know? Hmm. Is there any bands you can recommend that we can find some of that old stuff or it, someone asked a question earlier, like, is there any of it around? I was like, ah, good luck finding it. A lot of it has been, uh, has been remastered and put up. So for example, Fetty's band, uh, department of self eradication or self eradication department that he put it on, um, on Bandcamp, I believe. And maybe it's on Spotify too. I'm not sure. Um, but he, remastered those old tracks and then put them up some of them some of it is really cool and i think that a lot of the listeners will dig it um yeah right i mean russians are as much on band camp contemporary bands are as much on band camp as as um any other country uh bands right now i can't really recommend that many because i've been out of it since 2018 but i can say that uh, in Georgia, there have been some really cool bands, but they kind of they show up and then they disappear. So, like Funeral Mask, for example, is a is a cool band that developed. There's this awesome band. I think they're still around from St. Petersburg, called Ankulim. Um, uh, uh, I have to write it out in order to spell it, but uh, they're cool because they're like a they're a blend of metal punk and like russian folk so they have like an oh interesting shit. um i think it's a-n-k-y-l-y-m and that is in saint petersburg um and they're great and their their singer Ilya, he's a sociologist and he wrote a book about uh russian punk in the 90s because he grew up in the punk scene in the 90s which is its own thing so um definitely worth checking out you should check out some of the the classic bands um like tarakani which is still a band that i kind of i have a love hate with them really because they are very much opportunists they're one of those they sound just like green day they're one of those bands that's trying to make money off of um off of punk but you know good for them i guess uh um there is the, a lot of the the soviet era bands like object of ridicule um you might not be able to find there's a record label that was also inspired by my book Sianya. uh 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 s well, i gotta spell it out again um my friend bulyat uh I think it's S E Y A N E. Um, but what he did was he was also inspired by my book. Um, and so while I was finishing it, he started this kind of distro record label where he reached out to a lot of these old Soviet era bands and asked them for copies of their tape or their music of some sort so that he could remix it and then put out a compilation. So he did, he put out a compilation and I think it's on Bandcamp. 
um, that has some of these old bands in it, which is pretty cool. I don't know where he is now. I think Bulat is also one of the, I, he may be in Turkey now. Um, uh, but so yeah, there's a lot of cool bands. Uh, there's another another great band that you can find YouTube videos of from the the anti-fascist period, the early 2000s. And the name of their band is uh, Pravalentina Linyanka, which literally means straight edge in Russian. It's translated oh, directly. Uh, and they're great. They kind of remind me of like a... Um, Minor threat? Yeah, but with an element of that like sea squat sound. You know what I mean? What the fuck is a sea squat sound? You know, the East Coast, the um, like choking victim slash leftover crack sound. Okay. You, you but, took me a while to realize you were naming bands and not sounds. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, they, so they're pretty cool. You can find videos of them on YouTube. Um, uh, the another good, another classic in the 90s period is Karoli Shoot, uh, which means the uh, clown in the just. Uh, the King and the Jester, and mm. they they were they were probably the first famous punk band in Russia ever. They were playing sold out stadiums for the first time. They had oh, this whole, they had this whole image, this like folkloric image. Most of their songs are about like Russian folklore and and witches and shit like that. The singer died um, in the '90s, but the bass player he's still alive and he lives in California, and his son. Kirill is one of the people that opened the venue in Tbilisi. Oh, really? So actually, when I saw Kirill, because Kirill had been in the, the U.S. quite a, bu- a lot. His dad is a U.S. citizen now. And uh, he stayed with Tommy in the Bay when mm-hmm. he was going through. So I asked Kirill, I was like, why don't you just move to the U.S.? Like, why are you staying in Georgia? He's like, that's my dad's life, man. Like, this is where my people are. This is where I want to be. I want to be with my friends. I don't want to be in the U.S. He's like, I might still get my U.S. passport now because I can, and it's probably good to have. But he's like, but I'd rather be here. He's got bands. He's one of those kids that's, like, so good at guitar that he's in, like, six different bands. You know what I mean? Like, every every scene has one of them. This is a great comment. I have no idea who you guys are, but as an 80s kid, you had me at punk rock in the Soviet Union. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you are tuning into this as Revolution Podcast. So, podcast run by a real deal musician. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Matt Osborne. The MA, is that, uh, are you from Massachusetts? Or are you a master's of arts? Or, yeah, are you a master's and. In- Martial arts. I hope you're both. I hope cool. you're a Massachusetts martial arts master, Matt Osborne. Um, but yeah, we do we do several shows on punk rock, and definitely tune in to for April thirtieth when we're going to do the was nineteen eighty four the greatest year for punk and metal. We go over all the releases of punk and metal in the year of our Lord nineteen eighty four. That'll be a good time. Oh hell yeah. Military history master's degree. That's cool. All right, guys in the chat, leave Matt alone. <laughs> he just came here. Leave him alone. Don't, don't go after him now. Everyone's like, hey, everyone wants to jump on him now. Uh, leave the poor guy alone. Someone said, um, I never knew the USSR had punk rock. It's, it's one of those things you never think about because you just assume these things are everywhere because yeah. there's so there's such a global aspect of heavy music. Like when we do the show of what's the, the, the whole series we're doing, uh, what's the, what's the greatest year of music, right? We've done 93, 79 and 84. Mm -hmm. And when I make the playlist, I literally try to put as much as I can globally. So it's just not U.S. It's not just domestic releases. That would be a you know twenty song playlist, right? Born in the U.S.A., Purple Rain, Like a Virgin. You're like, oh yeah, '84 is the greatest year ever. Right? Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff that was popular in Brazil, in Japan, 
in Mexico, in Argentina. Uh, so I try to put it all as much as I can. So there's like a hundred, all the, all the playlists have a hundred and some songs, but you think that this music is everywhere. Like 1984, you think, oh, where's the Russian stuff? It's like, oh, I don't know. Not there. I mean, <laughs> not there. Yeah. It wasn't officially released. This is all underground. Super. You know, you know, is really like the first band that comes out of this early 80s punk group. I don't even want to call it a scene. It's a punk group in Leningrad that like then does become something, um, something bigger that makes international waves. But but that's sort of the reason that's how I got interested in the topic to begin with, how I started researching it was I was in uh, Nizhny Novgorod in 2012 doing a study abroad there. I was learning the Russian language there. And I think at the time I had like one or two tattoos, but they were they were evident. Right. It was like wearing a T-shirt and you could see it. And some kid came up to me just randomly on the street and he was like, you like punk rock? And I was like, yeah, how did you know? And he's like, well, you have tattoos and, you know, you're wearing black. And I just thought that, you know, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, yeah, you got me. And he was like, he's like, have you been to a punk show here yet? And I was like, honestly, I didn't know that you guys had punk shows. He's, I was like, I know there's this place in Nizhny called the Rock Club, right? And I would walk by there and I would hear like fucking smash mouth and shit blasting from the outside. So for me, it was like, I don't really want to go in there. It's not my, not my crew, you know? But, um, so he's like, he's like, all right, Friday night, meet me here. We're going to go to a punk show together. I'll show you, uh, I'll show you some Russian punk. I'll show you a good time. And I was like, all right, word. So this, I see you not, this is a real story. So I, five, uh, Friday comes, I go to the meeting place. It's dark out. It's getting dark out. It's it's like you know it's gonna be fully pitch black in ten minutes. I, I'm waiting. I'm in the middle of nowhere, right? It's a bus stop like outside the city. I'm waiting in the middle of nowhere. Finally, from across the field, I see some flashlights moving, and I was like, "What the fuck's going on?" Right? And this group of kids come up to me. One of them with the flashlight puts it in my face, and he's like, Are "You the American?" <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "I was like, yeah." Yeah, I'm the American. And he's like, you want to see punk rock? And I was like, yeah, yeah. That's what I was told to come here. He's like, all right, follow me. And so we we walked for 45 minutes in a direction that I have no idea. I don't know where the fuck we're going, right? We're just walking. I don't know the city. I had only been there for about a month. I didn't know, like, the outskirts of the city that well. You're walking for, like, 45 minutes. We come across this kind of industrial slash broken down zone and there's two old like uh industrial buildings factory old factories that are just completely abandoned and like uh uh fall decrepit that's the word and i see that there's an extension cord going from like somewhere far away into one of the buildings it's gonna be was, a great show i was like oh damn it's gonna be a great show if you so see I, an extension cord yeah. Powering a whole show, gonna be a great show. So I go in, and uh, the name of the band, if anybody wants to look it up, the Party Breaker. They used to be based out of Nizhny Novgorod. Then they moved to Moscow, and I'm not sure if they're a band anymore, but you'll still be able to find their music. Party Breaker, their name. And so I go in, and this place, it's it's a decrepit factory. The beams on the wall, the big wood beams, are like hanging down. There's nails coming out of the floor. Oh yeah. The, the area, the area in which the show is supposed to go on, is no bigger than this. The room that I'm in right now. Yep. It's it's pretty small, and you know, I'm I was drinking at the time, so I'm you know throwing them back, practicing my Russian with people, and you know everyone's so fascinated because I'm an American and how the fuck did I find this place? I was like, I don't know, man. They, they let me <laughs> Are you here for the blood feast? <laughs> yeah, they led me with flashlights. I have no idea what I'm doing here. Uh, and so everyone's like, oh, no, you're going to have a blast. And so I go in, party breaker starts, and the, the place erupts. It, 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 you got kids hanging on those yeah. wooden fucking beams that are hanging out. Yes. You got people moshing, and I'm sure, like, fucking up their feet on the na nails that are sticking out. And I was like, this is coming from Boston. 
I was like, this is the most genuine punk that I had seen in my life. Like for real, I, you know, I, I was, you know, when eighties hardcore was a thing, I wasn't of age. So I didn't have that experience of seeing hardcore in its beginning in like a genuine sense, but I had, you know, seen punk in the nineties. I saw the, the dropkick Murphys when they were still all skinheads uh, and playing like, you know, underground places. But I had never seen something so genuine and so DIY before. And I had been to DIY shows in Boston. I've been to basement shows. I've been to like small venues and stuff. I'd seen that. But it, there in Boston, you get crowds that stand around like this all the time. Right? They, maybe they're bobbing their head, but they, they've seen it yeah. all already. They've already seen everything, even by this period. So I'm here and party breaker starts and it just fucking goes wild. And I get pushed around and I'm like, this hasn't happened to me in a long time and i was like this is cool i want to talk to the band afterwards and so after i did end up talking to the band um i didn't at that point i didn't know that i was going to write a book so i wasn't doing like a formal interview but i was just talking to them about like what it is you know what kind of scene exists here and i was like honestly guys i had no idea what that russian punk was even a thing and they were like oh yeah like this is a small scene. And I was like, damn, all right, let's do it. Let's get into it. And then the next year I lived in Moscow and I got um, much bigger. I got exposed to Moscow's punk scene, which is a lot different. Um, but I yeah. Mean, would you agree now that you, you know, you got a couple stamps on the passport and you saw like an underground scene somewhere else where they don't have the, uh, a certain amount of, what's the word? What's a good word? I don't want to say spoiled. Oh, that's a good word. I've seen some crazy stuff in different parts of the world, right? Like shows yeah. where it's like, this is cool. Yeah. And we played some gnarly place in Brazil in 2019. And there was a dude, I don't know if he had a birth defect or what, but he was just kind of, he had arms and no legs. And uh, he was going hard. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he was going hard when we played, and he was like, "Just let me go on the floor," and he would just be like, "I think that in a lot of these places, punk has given people something to like really believe in and mm -hmm. and put their energy in in a world that like doesn't really give them that much to to commit to, and you might be able to make that same argument that like that was the case in the '80s too, right? That there were a lot of people that really believed in it, um, that were yeah. committed to it. You meet yes. them and they're autistic as fuck. And all they can do is talk to you about the coolest bands that are out there and like the, the equipment and the gear and all the stuff. They don't have a life outside of it. Right. Cause this is their life. Um, and you meet that and you, you see that still in the U S but it's kind of like, I don't, it's not commercialized. It's, I, I mean, I'm struggling to think of the same word that you are. It's, 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 it's a sense not, that there's, it's not just commercialization. There's something right. to it's your point. That, okay. Let, let's, 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 let's break it down like this. Even you're from a major metropolitan area. I'm from a major metropolitan area. I don't care if someone's throwing an underground show or some sort of underground thing there's a difference between an underground thing in LA or New York or Philly and an underground thing in Moscow, Idaho. Yeah. Because you, to your point, you've seen everything. Yeah. Every major artist is going to come through. Every aspiring artist is going to come through. You probably know some people that have made it made it whatever the hell that means maybe your best friend's band played warp tour whatever the hot thing is for people to play nowadays um when you don't have that at all at all so those shows are different they hit way different yeah that so uh connor said the quote that i said that there's this feeling that we've seen it all already in the states and i i think that's it that's the word that we're looking for we're looking for a word that captures the sense in the us where everyone 
has this kind of like I've seen it already position and it makes them kind of indifferent. It 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 like sucks the energy, their enjoyment out of the music that they're watching. Yeah. Right. So now you're just kind of standing around with your arms crossed they're awkwardly trying to figure out what to do with your arms, which is why, like, I don't really go to shows all that much anymore because I don't know about you, but like when I was a kid, my sister and I would like, um, you know, we would learn the choreography from a Backstreet Boys song and then we would perform it for <laughs> my mom. Right. Mm -hmm. It was fun. And so now when I go to shows, that's all I see is like adults doing that with instruments in their hand. And it's really hard for me to like not see that. But when you go to a place like like in Nijini that I was just explaining and you see that, then you're like, oh, this isn't cosplaying music. This isn't cosplaying yeah. scene anymore. Like this, this means something to everybody collectively in this room. And they all know each other. And they're all not socially grandstanding each other. They're all friends. They all love each other, right? It's a beautiful thing. Dude, I, uh, like I'm not, I'm, I, you didn't get a chance to do it because I think I was doing a show while you were here. And I don't know if there was anything going on because you kind of came you know, during the week, right? um but the scene in tj which you didn't get a chance to check out which i found is exactly what you're talking about yeah i saw a bunch of people of various ages which i thought was also cool it wasn't just kids it was ogs it looked like even their grandkids skaters taggers punks everybody moshing helping each other up loving the bands that are playing um a person helping facilitate that which is really hard to do in a big city for for a long period it, it's it th there's a reason why when i have the ogs from like the the metal and punk scene in the bay area they give so much props to this this one older uh, black gentleman that owned a place called ruthie's inn and if anybody listening is is a fan of any of the Bay Area bands from Metallica and even the non Bay Area bands like Slayer and Megadeth and Anthrax, even all those guys give Ruthie's in props because that's where they could play. Yeah, because there wasn't a lot of venues that would that would allow it. It's another thing we don't talk about. There's not a lot of places in 2024. Most of these posters behind me, which aren't even that old, these venues are gone. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I have posters just like that. I had to take them down because my last partner didn't like them. But I should put them back up now. <laughs> A woman I was dating actually did this. <laughs> it shouldn't. Very nice of her to do that. But you know, it, it's there's when we talk about scenes. It's hard to have a domestic scene because of that whole, like, as somebody said, desensitize, I'm over it vibe. Everybody's trying to get famous. When no one's trying to get famous because fame ain't nowhere near you, it's no, it's a whole different vibe in those spots yeah. when you play. And that's the one thing, and the one, one of the things that I miss about being a small band, having to tour in what's called a B market is when you play those places where there's no one's coming through. Yeah. You're miles away. You know, people forget see from Seattle East. If the next big show you play, if you don't go to Vancouver, which is still isn't that big of a show is Minneapolis. Yep. Most people just fly to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And we would play all these little bitty places. And some of those shows just went off because no one came. Yeah. Yeah, the Midwest is one of those, like, uh, roll of the dice places. When you're going through the Midwest, you don't know if your show is going to be nobody or you could even get a show where there's a bunch of people. And you're like, how the fuck did this happen? How did this happen? Yeah, all it takes is one. one I'd say, like, yeah. I One saved the poster. Social clout. You just shared your flyer, and everyone was like, "Yeah, let's do and it." Everyone shows up. Everyone. There was. We did a show in Moscow, Idaho. It was our first time in Moscow, and we we're at this dude's house, and he was kind of like chilling. He was like doing blow with his girlfriend. And we we're like, "Okay, we're supposed to be playing," and everyone 
said your house is supposed to be like this dope spot. He's like, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll text people. And he sent out a text message, and there was just people overflowing in the house. <laughs> it was like a Sunday. He had forgotten we were supposed to be there. It was one of those things. And then everybody shows up. The walls are sweating when we're playing. And, you know, that that's... <sighs> That's that's something I miss, and I've, I've been able to see it as an as an older person now. I'm 46, man. I'm not trying to you know ride the lightning like I was 10 years ago, but um, I really love seeing you know people find that communal bond. You know, as we talk about leftism on this show all the time, one of the things that I think it's really missing is a sense of community. Yeah. And there's something about those those venues that we would go to. I'm still friends with people from music scenes I was in as a teenager. So I think I'm social sure. media has changed the quality of community as well oh. in certain ways. But um yeah, I mean that 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 sense of uh indifference or the sense that we had seen it everywhere, it exists in Russia too. That there are some bands that I interviewed from smaller towns like Izhevsk, for example. So great. One of my favorite Russian punk bands ever mm -hmm. is from the town of Izhevsk. It's called Minefield. They have a band camp. Look that up there. They <laughs> were amazing. They were a phenomenon that existed for like a year, and but they came out with a fucking boom and a bang, and people still talk about them. I'm still talking about them. And all their members kind of live different places now. But... Anyway, uh, one of the members, Sasha, I was interviewing him and he made that point. He's like, I like playing the smaller towns better because mm. people are genuinely into what you're doing. And he's like, and then we go to Moscow and everyone doesn't care. Like nobody gives a fuck what we're doing. We go to St. Petersburg and like people actually care what we're doing. But he's like in Moscow, like you... You could get an audience. You get a you get a, a room of a hundred people, but no one's gonna mosh. No one's gonna. Everyone's gonna feign like they don't give a shit because they've seen it. You know. So he's like, I like playing the smaller places better. Oh, dude, there's no money in it though. There's no money. <laughs> there's there's no money. In it. There was no money in us going to Juarez, Mexico. You know. But fuck, you know, the last time we were there, it was a room full of people. And we were like, whoa, they're here to see us. What did we do right? Yeah. Right? That's when I was in, when I was in TJ, we did go to that. Uh, we went to the bar, the club. Oh, the bar. But you went in the day. Yeah, we went in the day, so we didn't see a show or anything. But There's shows yeah. there sometimes. But that, that bar is my favorite bar in the world. Next time, we're going to go. We'll see a show there. Kushluk says, speaking of no money, when is there a TIR Mexico meetup? You know what's funny, Kushluk, that you say that? Like, I've been wanting to do a Mexico thing because A, crossing the border, as Alex knows, is a bitch. Yeah. And there's some really cool places here that would actually let us do stuff. They would actually even let us do a show. Um, so I don't know. It's just if you people, if you people tell me that you would come to this part of Mexico, then I would definitely do a TIR thing in Mexico. And you can get Tommy's band to play Piss Mist. I saw some video footage of Tommy playing. Yeah. I was so proud of him. <laughs> you, can get that, you can get them to come down and play. It's cool. <laughs> I'll bring I'll I'll bring my uh my mini Korg and I'll just do some weird synth shit and we'll call it my sound project. See this. Uh, Anton says something real interesting, and I want to. Uh, we can we can riff on this for a while. Anton says it's why the state needs to provide an income for art production, which is why I find the failure in the USSR interesting. It the state's also going to have to approve art production, and we have to be under the assumption that the state would approve a band like <laughs> Two Live Crew, right? Swans, uh, Anal Cunt. NWA. Yeah. So the Soviet Union had like writers unions and and that was the rock club intended to be kind of like a musician's union, right? But 
in practice it's a lot harder because like jason was saying with certain like forms of art you just get like if everyone's sort of allowed to do it then you get just this proliferation of, of different genres that transcend like the the time like that are looking beyond the time or looking backwards and so i don't know it can be kind of hard i guess for for state officials to see what is genuine you know what what is new what is innovative because they're looking at the present um, i mean maybe you don't get what is what is that uh sexy red right yeah. maybe maybe there's no sexy reds uh, you know maybe there's no drake maybe there's no rock him yeah that's the thing there's like you know i agree that the state should pay artists but that means is that the state gets to decide who is an artist and who isn't uh and what that means is that certain people are granted m more resources to do their art and others aren't and so devising a system for that to happen in an equitable way and one that can embrace the diversity of artistic forms musical sounds and lyrics and content and all that stuff that's the hard part, right? That's the part that yeah. I think we as socialists need to be thinking about that kind of stuff. We not need to be thinking about whether or not Lenin would agree if we should vote for president in 2000. <laughs> Who gives a fuck about that? We need to be thinking yeah. of ahead of like, well, what do we want these systems to actually look like? Because yeah. once we figure that out, then that's what we can actually promote to people. Like, hey, you're a struggling artist. Did you ever think about the possibility of socialism doing this for you, you know? Like you know, people have mentioned Canada and I know people that have gotten the Canadian grant and you know, it's more skewed than you think. It can be specific to certain ethnicities and genders, um, which, you know, I don't have a problem with. Again, I, I knew a band that got the grant and it was pretty cool. They got the tour, but their music was a little out there. It definitely wasn't for everybody. Actually, uh, domestically, um, I know there's subsidized housing, or there was in New Orleans for artists if you could prove that like a majority of your income came from your art, which is pretty cool. Um, which, you know, that to me is more important than uh, proving somebody, you know, making a record. Like, can you help somebody have housing? That's That's a big problem with, you know music today you know there's no there's no place where your rent's going to be a few hundred bucks a month and you can afford to figure out your sound like like you you know all these weird bands you hear in the 80s and even 70s they could you know work on their craft because their living expenses were affordable yeah that's gone <laughs> Did you see this comment? What Alex described is just a record company. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's some truth to that, though. The difference is that record companies, because of the market in which they exist, they are incentivized by that market, right, to get what is the hottest thing, what's going to generate the most income for them. If you can take that profit incentive out, then then maybe a record company is a good starting point, right? But but rethinking about how record companies operate and how they justify signing the artists that they do, right? Taking the market out of it might be, you know, a place, a, an option worth looking into. Oh yeah, I did. I, sometimes I'm amazed at some of the stuff I, I find. I played you that, that young lady I just found out of the UK. I find that, that music is so interesting. Yeah. I still do find I still do find um, some interesting artists too. I mean, I I'm at a point, like I said, I don't really go to shows all that much anymore. Where I'm just kind of like musically jaded <laughs> in a lot of ways. That it's it's kind of like a hurdle that I have to overcome. I think I want I will, okay when you come back down here, definitely we'll we'll make sure that your trip is arranged around a show because it wasn't just that I found this scene. I met a family in the scene. Hell yeah. 
I met a dad that's about your age. And he was with, when we first met, there was a show in an alley, kind of like how you describe. There's an extension cord <laughs> powering way too much stuff. I know people are getting shocked playing instruments. Um, and these kids have set up a very archaic half pipe with concrete dividers, like freeway dividers. Yeah. I love that. And they're and they're going ham, right? And then there's there's a dude behind me, and he's actually speaking English to his daughter, and she won't go in the mosh pit. And I and I turn around, we talk, and and three months later, he saw me again in in downtown TJ with with Shaka Connie, and he goes, he goes, um, oh, there's a show in this place, and, da, da, da. and then I met his wife, and then he's got a son, and I met the son. And then, uh, you know, fast forward a few weeks ago, me and a buddy, I was trying to show him this cafe that shows free movies. This cafe also is the place where the punk kids have their big shows. And um, we, there just happened to be a show there. And then my, my buddy was there and his son now is, you know, goes into the mosh pit. He's not scared anymore. And you know, that, that's a pretty cool thing to, to be a part of, uh, a yeah. scene like that where you feel that welcome, especially yeah. as an outsider. Um, and, and that's what I would hope every scene strives for. I think every, I think every scene has had it at some point, but there's kind of like a, you know, I don't know if it works in the wave or if it's something else now, but I don't know. It's hard. Providence where I live now, it's a small city, but. And you would think that small city, small scene, everyone's cool, but everyone hates each other. It's Swag. Kind of hard. Swag. I don't dig it. I mean, look, man. U.S. is a very specific place. Those be, becoming friends with those 80s thrash dudes, one thing I will say is there's a, there's a camaraderie that they have that I really appreciated. Even with young cats like me and them helping people like me, and I'm nobody. So it, it, it exists. It exists. Yeah, it does. It, I mean, yeah, you, you still see it here and there. But um, that being said, if anybody has a lead on a remote job <laughs> that will allow me to move to Europe, please let me know. Where you can enjoy a really good scene and yeah. health care. <laughs> Speaking of punks, you know who was on the show recently? Do you know Oxbow? Is it, are you too young to know Oxbow? Yeah. You do know who Oxbow is? Yeah, I've heard the name. Okay. The singer Eugene Robinson is a friend, and he came on the show. He's also a pretty well-known journalist, and he's moving to, to Europe. Damn. He's already got a spot. All these chumps are moving to Europe, and I can't get the fucking job to do it. The thing is that like, I, I need a U.S. paying job to do it, which is why remote is ideal. But I got to fly back frequently. Hey, so some genius says uh, Thrasher Unity is okay, but Black Unity is not okay. Well, if you think all Black people have all the same interests in them, that's then you know. I guess you're unified with Puffy then, mm. right? Puffy is part of your Black Unity project, and R. Kelly is part of your Black Unity project. Kanye West. Clarence Thomas is part of your Black Unity project. Coleman Sorry. Hughes is part of your Black Unity project. I mean, Candace Owens is part of your Black Unity project. I mean, the, th the thing is that, like, you know, a lot of people you're, you're listening are of a specific class. And so the counter argument could be like, well, you know, Black Unity among the Black work class. But even within the working class, there's been a lot of work done that there's divisions within that, too. Yeah, I mean, saying that saying that black people in the working class are united is as ridiculous as saying white people in the working class are united. You know what I mean? There's some people. Oh, you want to see the Gish Gallup? Do all thrashers have the same personality? Well, that's not what we said. You said there you are know. some some people in uh, in the the white working class who I can't stand. Um, they can't stand me. Yeah. It's it's a it's a very interesting notion because I never hear people talk about white unity. I think they just believe that it exists. Yeah. 
But yeah, I mean, you can't really talk about that. I'm not gonna have a conversation with you right now about white unity. White unity. <laughs> no. You don't want to sing "White Minority" by Minus. <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't exist. It didn't he stop? Did he stop performing that song at one point? Because he was like, "What do you mean a Nazi singing this song?" Yeah. You you didn't see that coming, Ian. All those guys are like, they didn't know what they were writing back then. I mean, I don't think any of them were like racist, but they just were fucking dumb, you know. This there's there's this idea that this person has that I really believe is a white person. If you don't believe in all black people being unified as one mighty block of a minority, then you don't believe in anybody being unified as one mighty one mighty block as a minority. And I find it fascinating that they believe that. And when you say stuff like, oh, well, why don't you go fucking, you know, show me your unity block. Show me you going across class lines. Yeah. There's no unity block, period. Maybe, no, not even. Explain no. Washington, D.C. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there's class, there's there's certainly something to be said about the ruling class having more unity than than any other. And especially that allows them the ability to exclude members or to banish members from the ruling class with impunity when they want to. When, when, uh, when it's politically expedient to get rid of a politician, they can do it at any point. You know, all of them are corrupt. Nobody doubts that Nancy Pelosi's stock trading is is uh, insider trading and that's corrupt. But it's not politically expedient to expose her right now and take her to court for it. When it is, then they can do that. They'll do it whenever they want. But they don't. If they're not going to do it now, then. Why do it? Yeah, I would yeah. say that the I would say that the ruling class is more united than any other class in the United States. Well, don't tell that to this person that definitely thinks that uh, some ass clown. I love the internet, dude. Love it. Oh yeah, OJ died today. OJ died today. You know, hey. Here's unity for you. Black unity is OJ getting off, right? The juice the majority black. The uh, juice has jury. expired. If black unity is OJ getting off because it was a majority black jury, what is it then when a majority black jury convicts a black person of murder? It does happen more than you think especially in these wacky things called black neighborhoods. So explain that one to me. For real? Yeah. Who's this fool? I don't know. Some old white guy. Yeah, OJ, OJ, the, the juice has expired. <laughs> he dead. He is. And it's, and it's, I so, saw um, the love of my life lives in Europe. And um, I was talking to her about it earlier today. And she told me that in Austrian newspapers, like there was some Austrian article that came out that said, um, OJ Simpson, famous football star, dead at 76. And she's like, I went to the comments and everybody was like, uh, famous football star? Like, aren't you forgetting like a major part of this dude's uh, career? Uh, there was, a major like, part of his career was winning the Heisman and... There's Rush like, for 2,000 yards. There's like, but it just, it had renewed debate within this comment section about his murder, you know? And I think the same thing is happening in the U.S. You see it everywhere. Like, you know, all the OJ memes that are coming out are just renewing debates about guilty, not guilty, and all that stuff. Uh, I was talking to Ture about it today, and he had a good comment. He goes, Chris Rock took an interesting angle where he was like black people too happy uh, white people too mad I was like, hmm. that was fair i don't know if you were you were probably what like four during that time yeah yeah 
your your parents probably would have been really angry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's call this a night. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm, yeah, show... I'm, I'm catching up on the comments. Oh, don't read the comments, dude. It's a dangerous uh, world in the comments. Yeah, I want to see this gorilla communism shit. Oh, I didn't send it to you. No. Oh, I'll send it to you. Let me see it. I know Andrew is working on a thing too. Uh, Dizzle actually made a shirt. A phys- like, there's a physical shirt. Apparently, it's, it's on fun. its way. I will, I will have it on air. Yeah. Damn, yeah. we're doing it. We're inventing it. Um, we're doing it. We're starting a movement. Guerrilla communism. There you go. Starting happen right here oh see everybody wants to grab your old book but not your your newer book remember alex came on this show to talk about horror movies in the soviet union yeah uh if you want the punk book um hit me up on social media because i'm getting some author copies for the europe tour and i could just sell it to you that way and then the, the money that you pay for will help me fucking traveling within europe and stuff um so yeah hit me up if you want a copy of that book also keep your eye out for the documentary release my instagram is at punks around my twitter is alex t herbert all one word squished together and i also do the lennon in 45 volumes um, I will I will leave as many com or as many links to Alex as possible. And I try to do a lot of shit, dog. You know. You know you're busy. You're busy, man. You're a Renaissance man. That's it. But thank you for your time. Thank you guys for checking it out. And the show will be back Saturday a.m. for me. I definitely won't be here. We have North tending to family business. Also, don't forget, there should be a link in the description for tickets to the live show in Washington, D.C. Adolph Reed, Pascal Robert, Derek Varn, Daniel Tut. You know, Daniel Tut thought I was actually mad at him because he debated uh, Haas. Oh, shit. Lula's here. Oh, man. I'm so embarrassed about my champagne room. Uh, conversation last time. <laughs> Lula, uh, it came went, up the other day, by the way. Where, how? <laughs> oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you see how Lula wrote? Let's let's. You want to read her comment out loud, Alex? For extreme punks, guerrilla communism is an excellent band name that I've been pondering it since Alex was last on. I'll start the band Guerrilla Communism with you. Okay. Um, speaking of guerrilla communism, Toussaint is putting up links to your books right now. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I said, if you want the punk book, reach out to me personally. You can buy it from me. Um, or, you know, get it on Amazon or whatever. If that's what you prefer. Um, no, what happened? What was said about? Oh, you? dude. You, you, you just went down in TIR history. I... I love thank God it. Thank God it was in the champagne room, which is just it's so the champagne room last night was we did a special one last night. It was so bad. I'm debating about taking it down. Hell yeah. I love this. <laughs> I like I mean, I was going to tell the chat to keep the shit talking coming because I love that shit. I thrive on it. I'm an yeah. academic man. I've been cast in the fire of criticism. Like there's pretty much nothing these people could say to me that will like really get under my skin keep it coming dogs talk all the shit you want i love it i'll talk shit back man the, the, this is what you're famous for do you see it on the screen scary fat ladies <laughs> white white, white. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's a caveat. really important detail does alex know about a <laughs> lot no alex doesn't and i can't play that video again um no i don't yeah but no i know i i didn't 
I didn't hear anything about that appearance in the champagne, so I'm wondering what the... Oh, dude, yeah, you came up in the champagne. Well, well, last night, the champagne room was supposed to be people call in and tell embarrassing sex stories. No one called in, so it was me and Mac telling embarrassing sex stories for like two hours. Hmm. Like, really embarrassing. All right. Like, you know... <laughs> Oh, I can see why you might want to take it down. All right. Mac Mac at least had a few drinks in him when he was telling crazy stories. <laughs> this Alex is right though. Every fat white woman I've met is bad too. <laughs> you know, uh, what is that quote? There's a quote that's like the most revolutionary thing you could do is tell the truth. And so I just want to leave you all with that quote. As I as I sign off of this uh, podcast, it's the most revolutionary thing you do is tell the truth. <laughs> See, Anton says, "Oh wow, I got one for the books. I wish you would have called in last night, Anton." You know what? Maybe maybe we'll do a, a call in show for embarrassing sex stories, not in the champagne room, and just do a regular Saturday morning show and open up the phone lines to everybody. I'll call in. I don't. I've got a few. I think. <laughs> when you start thinking, almost everyone is embarrassing, and yeah, I mean, you made me feel better about one that I was embarrassed about. Yeah, but I, I can give you one right now. Uh, you, on the regular show, you want to do this before yeah. we end? Yeah, yeah, I was young, so I, I'm a, I was very young. Um, I think I was like 19 or something like that, but uh, I was dating this person that she was pretty cool. Her mom was like really attracted to me. Um, <laughs> her mom offered to uh, and no and and like drink vodka with her, but no, I didn't do it. Um, but that was later. But anyway, I never actually had sex with this person that I dated because um, I'm my standards are very high i'm a very prudish person and um i was back then and i still am now to a certain extent although i'm older and i understand that people that i date now are older so you have to make certain compromises uh in terms of standards but um but i the moment had come right I, we were just about to get it on for the first time i had my pants down and she was standing up and she was starting to take her pants down too and uh because i nut quick <laughs> <laughs> and uh um i i really didn't like what i saw <laughs> and like i said i was i was like i think i was eight i was maybe 19 Right, so I was like old enough where I was still living with my mom, but young enough where I was still living with my mom, but old enough that I drove. And so she she took her pants off, and uh, I really didn't like what I saw. And so I just made an excuse. I was like, "Oh shit, my mom just texted me, and like I gotta go home and take care of some shit. Like something happened with the neighbors." You must have saw something extremely frightening. I'm not gonna get into that detail. <laughs> but, uh, it was not a penis. It was not, it was not a trans, this is not a trans, a bash on trans people. It was not that. Um, no. It was just for me, for 19 year old Alex, it was very unappealing. And so I was like, I gotta get out of here. And so I just like, I think she like went into another room to like get something. And I quickly like put my pants back up and I fucking ran out the door. And then this is a real fucked up part. I never went on another day with her ever again. I still see her here and there. She lives in Providence now. Years later, I was dating somebody who uh, ended up being like somebody, <laughs> the actual beaver. <laughs> yeah, years later, um, I, I was dating somebody and it was like my first real like adult serious relationship. And um, 
and I was really into that person. But I got a phone, I got a text message from this other girl's mom. She was like, what are you doing tonight? And she was cool. Like she was in the 80s hardcore. She had grown up in 80s hardcore. Her brothers were into it. She's a very cool person. And I got a, a text message from her. She was like, what are you doing tonight? I was like, oh, I'm just chilling, just hanging out. She's like, you want to come over and drink some vodka? And I was like, kind of weird. Um, I was like, no, nah, not tonight, but like, I'll come over another time. We can catch up. And then uh, I don't know how it happened exactly. I really don't remember. But it devolved into her describing to me how she gives blowjobs. Whoa. And I was like, I am at my girlfriend's house right now. I don't want to be having this text conversation. This is very bad. Uh, and I was like, you know, I well, how did she that. give blowjobs? I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. I don't remember. I mean, it was very detailed. She was talking about like, you know, she makes sure that she, the whole thing gets in there a little bit of the balls too. I'm sure that was part of it. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I didn't do it. Right. So I, I was dating someone at the time that I was very serious about that I liked a lot. So I was like, no, I'm not gonna do that. And I was like, I'll see you around. I hope you're well. And, um, I think like a year or two later or a year or two later, uh, this ex and I broke up and I was like, fuck, I should have let my ex's mom blow me. <laughs> I like, I, it's one of my biggest regrets in life that I didn't get blown by ex's mom. I, it was there. It was, it was, it was present. It was there. <laughs> I did the right thing in denying it because I was dating somebody else. I know I was right at the time, but now in hindsight, what a fool I was. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of wish I could have seen this woman's vagina because I don't think it was that bad. No, I've in my mind, I'm thinking it must have looked like a Monchichi. It wasn't just a vagina. Oh, she had weird thighs. It was a lot. Yeah, it, it was just a, you know, an Audi navel. Pants can, <laughs> pants can hold in a lot of things. Oh, it was one of those. Yeah, holding a lot of things, but like, oh. but like, uh, I don't know. There's limits, but for <laughs> me, um, it was a culmination of a lot of things. And I, because it happened so long ago, I feel like I built it up into this fucking like monster in my head, or like where I remember it now. I remember, like it almost has hands at this point. <laughs> Like I, it's been so long that it's just kind of the the myth. I gotta lift and I gotta I gotta slide. I gotta lift and slide. I don't know what. It is. And the thing is that the thing is that I still see her around. I saw her like two weeks ago, um, coincidentally at the bar with her mom, um, which is weird. Uh, and um, I, I mean, I love them both. They're both great people. Uh, but I still wonder, does it still look like that down there? <laughs> Comments are going so <laughs> bad. That's the <laughs> Oh my god. Alex Choosy Lover. Choosy Lover. <laughs> That's it. A lot so, of my a lot of my stories are, are like that. It's like So chat, chat. For those of you that know the lore now of a Damien and a Herald, is Alex a Damien or a Herald? We need to know if Alex is a Damien or a Herald. It wasn't a vagina you saw a snatch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No way a Damien. <laughs> Is he a Rufus? <laughs> he is a Rufus. <laughs> I don't know what any. I don't know what that means. You oh, to... dude, you don't want to be a Damien, man. No, you don't want to be a Damien. <laughs> Volk says motherfucker has his own category. <laughs> <laughs> most of my most of my weird sex stories are a lot like that. It's like me drunkenly getting into scenarios thinking that something good is about to happen and then realizing that I'm not. And so like 
finding ways to weasel myself out of it. Um, Have you ever ran out of a house with no pants on? Um, no, I've never done that. I definitely, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I go, I got a couple of stories. <laughs> That that one is going down in TIR Lord. That's pretty <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> That's pretty that's pretty bad. Cause at nineteen Yeah, there was nothing that was gonna stop me at nineteen. Just to see one in real life, I'd have been like <gasps> I'd been like the Goonies finding all the gold. One time one time I waited in a closet for five hours for someone's mom to leave. Damn. Yeah. Erect the whole time. Yeah, and naked because I, my pants were outside of the closet and I couldn't go get them. So I was just sitting there in the closet, like hard as fuck, and listening to the Colombian. And so I could I couldn't understand what was being said, but I could hear like her mom yelling at her and shit. And I was like, I was like, this is actually kind of hot because like she was hot, she was Colombian, and and, uh, and your and your fucking cocks looking like Pinocchio's nose after he told eight lies. But I was like, how the fuck do I get out of this? Right, because her mom had gotten home from work, and her mom like got home from work and didn't leave. <laughs> so, and I didn't have a phone at the time, so I couldn't communicate with my girlfriend to be like, "Yo, find a way to get your mom to leave for a minute." Uh, so, like, I think she just got it, and eventually her mom like went to the grocery store. So this is the same mom, mind you, because I grew up like you know wearing the punk uniform and I had short shorts. One time I was at a barbecue. And she was sitting across from me, and I crossed my legs in my nutsack. Just fell <laughs> it fell out of my pants, right? And my girlfriend, who was behind her mom, looked down at my nuts and then up at me to like she just like yo. And then her, I saw her mom look, and her mom just, just started busting. Up. <laughs> and I didn't know what the hell was going on, so I'm just sitting there like, "What are you guys looking at? Like it's weird." And then finally, like she. <laughs> Told me like Alex, your your nuts hanging out. Like, oh. <laughs> hey Alex, yeah. the, the bubble gum's on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty embarrassing too. Um, that was the same mom. She wasn't hot. She was cool though, but she wasn't hot. Um, only only one hot mom. That, and you didn't get blown by her, and you ran out of the room. Yeah. For her weird yeah. vagina we child. Man, I got, I actually have a lot of weird sex stories now that I think about it. See how much fun this show could be? Yeah. We should, we should do it. We should do an all star TIR show. We bring in all these guests and every, and a guest tells a story. Yeah. Takes some calls. And then another guest comes in, tells a crazy story, takes some calls. If you guys are down for that, send me a message and I will definitely set it up. I'm not lying like last time. Thank you guys for hanging out. We went two hours on this. I didn't know we were going to go so long. That's... That's what she said. <laughs> I had to press that button. <laughs> you got to get the, for me, you have to get that loud buzz with it. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> just, for, just for when I'm the on. The horn, the horn. Every time Alex drops something that's like. Controversial. This is kind of yours too. Keep fucking with me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Lula, I'm so sorry to be offensive again. Uh, th again, this is all part of the script that Jason sends me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't send you a script today. I had one ready for you, and then you were insulting me and. and <laughs> <laughs> wrong fucking country dumbass. <laughs> oh i thought i thought you meant when uh when you told me that the time was different and i was like you people can't organize <laughs> <laughs> you people can't organize for shit <laughs> <laughs> so so in the email that jason sent out it said that the podcast started at eight so at eight i was here I sent him a message like, what's going on? He's like, oh, no, it starts at nine. There's like a glitch in the system. And I was just like, you people can't organize to save your lives. <laughs> I don't know. I yes, fell yes, out. you people, 
interpret that as broadly as you want. Dude, I fell the fuck out. <laughs> I fell the fuck out reading that. Oh, wait. I out and drop something controversial like his nut. Well, <laughs> You guys can't see below the. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, my God. Can't see below. The <laughs> Last time you guys were streaming while not live, that was a me. F- I did that. I made that mistake. Yeah, we said some dirty shit. Y'all missed it. You, you missed it. We just filth, flung, filth. <laughs> All right. For real, we're gone this time. Thank you, Alex. I have to get ready. <laughs> you impose sanctions on that ass. Yeah. It's like every time I want to fucking end the show. You know what's really funny? Someone from Twitter was watching, and I can't respond to Twitter comments. Uh, in the in the in the program that we use, I can, can see them. them like, though? Can, huh? Can you see them though? I can see the Twitter comments. I can see the comments from all the different places where we're streaming, and I hope that person is still going to watch the show. Because <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I'll like click on the Twitter feed mm-hmm. and I'll talk mad shit in the comments, but I can't tell if it's it's it's, it's a glitchy. It's in beta. The Twitter thing is in beta. Beta. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, he's still in the closet waiting on the clone. <laughs> <laughs> still in the closet. It's true. There's, a, there's some psychological uh, reading that you can do there. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm just mad you had a boner that whole time. Yeah, no, it wasn't fun. I used to, oh man. I, I mean, I could keep going. I'm not going <laughs> to. Let's just say when you're 16 and you have access to gas station boner pills, you really need to think about when and where you're taking those pills gas station boner pills are like mad caffeine and weird other shit so you're probably crapping like a madman this is where this is where the gorilla image came from because in those on those uh gas station boner pill packs there's one that has a gorilla on it and i used to buy the gorilla pills all the time i would pop that shit before school just so that it looked just so that it looked like i was always bricked up <laughs> bricked up i'm not lying so like you know because I wore tight pants because I was a punk kid right so yeah. I would take a boner pill for school and then my you know it would be like impressed in my pants <laughs> so like people in school they just thought that like yo Alex is well endowed but little did they know they're just walking around with a rager all the time I was gorilla I was gorilla pilled out that's <laughs> Jim just says why. <laughs> I don't know why. Because that's what I'm saying. When if you're if you're 16 and you have access to fucking gas station boner pills, you need to really think about what you're doing and why. I'm 46. Should I take a gas station boner pill? I don't know. I, it might give you a heart attack at this point. <laughs> These things are not they're not good for you. <laughs> Keep saying he's punk, like that explains it. I mean, it, it explains the skinny pants, of course. I don't, I can't do it anymore. I'm trying to let my balls be free, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I mean, you know me in real life, so you know how my pants roll. I don't care, dude. I'm showing the dick print all the time. Yeah, well, then maybe the gorilla uh, kills a few. Nah, dude, I'm, I'm, ter- I'm terrified of that shit. I'm terrified. And you know, you've seen the pharmacies down here. It's like the moment you see a pharmacy, they're fucking trying to give you dick pills. <sighs> Terrifying. To try it next time down there. Get a dick pill? It might play, it might make for an interesting game of tag, you're it. <laughs> 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 he pops some of those boner pills <laughs> around fuck ass niggas. What do you need? You don't want me to crack your back. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, you guys are getting a sneak peek into what it's like when I'm on the champagne room too. <laughs> you guys are definitely getting a lot of free champagne on this show. Hey, if you guys want to support what we do here, definitely share this. It goes a long way. Um 
drop a super chat drop a super thanks for as little as three dollars a month three dollars for the year you can become a patron if you're listening to the show later on apple just subscribe you can get access to all of the champagne rooms past and present and on that note <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna force an ending Ooh, that didn't sound right <laughs> no my brother hey you hush you got to buy uh thank you guys and let's go out with some some peaceful cartoons good night <laughs>